So let's start with where the idea came from for what I want to share with you briefly, and that is the scriptures. Uh, that's, that's what we, we go by. That's what we, we, we live by, as it were. And it says here in 2 Timothy and chapter number 2, the fifth verse, it tells us something that's very interesting. It says, also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And I was reading this scripture, and it just popped up in my mind that, you know, if, if love was a game, there are also rules that guide the game of love. And he's telling us here that if you want to be crowned, um, as some of you, the crown you want is a husband. Uh, I, I don't know what the crown is. Like my wife calls me Ademi, which in our language means my crown. So maybe that's the crown you are looking for. But it says here that unless you compete according to the rules, you're not going to get the crown. So there are certain rules that are in place. And I like the way he puts it in the New Living Translation of that scripture. It says... And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. Follow the rules. Unless they follow the rules. So we cannot win this, this game unless we actually follow the rules. So these are the rules. This is what I want to talk about tonight. Every game has rules. And where there are no rules, there's literally lawlessness. If you imagine a game of soccer. I just finished watching uh, Chelsea hold back my team uh, at home today. And I was really sad coming up here. But... You know, the only reason why they could go away from Etihad Stadium with a point is because they followed the rules. They played according to the rules. When, it, when the ball went out of play, they threw the ball back in. When it's goal kick and the referee says kick it out, that's exactly what they do. And that's the only way you can win any significant prize. And Paul gives us um, a very interesting uh, concept here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. I like it in the easy-to-read translation. So that every time I talk to singles, this is what I like to start with because this is what Paul started with. He says, I'm saying these things to help you. I'm not telling you what you must do. I'm not here standing as the, the, the final authority on everything in relationship and telling you this is exactly what you have to do. But I'm just telling you what I believe will help you. And this is what has helped us in our own 12 years of marriage. So where the Bible is clear, though, because I know that there are, there are some of us who, who maybe you're in the room today or you're watching this later on and you, you are, you don't, you're not a Christian, you don't consider yourself a Christian, uh, this event is open to everybody. But for, for me, because I'm a pastor, I mean, my foundation is the Bible, so I have to use the Bible as the basis. But even if you are not a practicing Christian, uh, you, 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 you can learn one or two things from, from what I want to share. And I always tell the people in this house that even if you're not a Christian, if you open up the Bible and you read the parable of talents and you follow that principle in your finances, you will get results. How many people know that? You will. You will get results. So that's the way it is. But if you are a Christian, though, uh, these are not just rules for you. They become a guideline. They become things by which you have to live your life. So here we go. Rule number one is called boundaries. The first rule is the rule called boundaries. Every game has boundaries and borders. There is literally no game on the earth <laughs> that is played without boundaries. Every game, whether it is soccer, basketball, anything at all, there is, there is marked out boundaries within which you are allowed to play that game. If you step out of those boundaries, you are no longer playing that game. You are playing something else. And you are not going to get the prize. So the first thing we have to understand is in this game of love, we have to set our own boundaries. We must create those boundaries and, and tell ourselves from the beginning before we even get into the game, to say, these are the boundaries I am going to play by. Is somebody with me tonight? Yeah. These are the boundaries. And I'm not going to play outside of these boundaries. Otherwise, I'm not going to get the prize. So if, if, if you go out of the boundaries, you, you either get disqualified or you even get a, a, a more serious penalty of getting kicked out of the game completely because you are not playing according to the boundaries that have been set. So ensure you are playing with certain boundaries. Otherwise, you have already lost the game. What are these boundaries? The first one is this. Do not, do not marry somebody who does not believe what you believe. I will say it again for clarity. Do not marry someone who does not believe what you believe. Especially when it comes to your faith. Whatever that is. Don't marry someone who does not believe what you believe. Otherwise, you are setting yourself up for a big shock. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Look at what it says here. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. It says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? This concept of unequally yoked is a, is a, is a picture of farm animals in, back in the day. 
when they want to plow, they put, they put oxen together and they yoke them together so that together they can pull more strength and more weight. When they are unequally yoked, though, one of the animals is weaker than the other, so it starts to drag it back. That's what he's talking about. That if you, if you get un unevenly yoked, which is this person does not believe what you believe in, but because of attraction, because of feelings and all of those things, you decide that by force, by fire, I'm going to, I'm going to get yoked to this person, and you plow along with it, you will find out when you begin to plow, what they find out is that when they go back to the field that was supposed to be plowed, it's very uneven. And that's what happens with many people's lives. You see that they've been married for several years, but because they don't believe the same thing, the, the, the marriage is uneven. There's so much imbalance, and they can't get as much from the marriage or from the field as they, as they were supposed to. So that is the first boundary you want to create. Even before you start putting up your, your dating profile or start swiping right or left, you need to set that clear from the beginning. I'm not going to end up with anybody who does not share my beliefs. I'm tempted to say, like Peter always says, if he didn't dare, he didn't dare. <laughs> so if it's not there, it's not there. Don't try to force it. Don't say that you are going to change the person when you get into the relationship. That is the first boundary. Number two boundary, and this one is pretty very, very old-fashioned. Uh, but if you look at me, you know I'm not old-fashioned at all. So, <laughs> so it's up to you to decide whether it is or not. The second boundary you have to set for yourself is there shall be no sex before marriage. Okay, some people are already looking at me. Am I in the right place? <laughs> no what? No sex before marriage. That is the, that is, don't forget what I said. If, you, if there are no boundaries, there is no game. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Look at what it says here, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee sexual immorality. He's not telling us to negotiate it or to talk about it or to, to, to discuss it. When we, when we start addressing questions, I'll, I'll focus on this a little bit more. Um, you flee from this stuff. Because every sin that a man does is outside the body. He who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. I love the analogy that one pastor used, and I thought about using it today, but I just, I just want to make this short. Um, it, it took tape, like, like when you have black tape, some of you might see some of those kind of tapes, and he put it on a piece of rug like this one that I'm standing on and peeled it off. Of course, you know what happens. Part of that rug sticks to the, to the tape. Then he takes it and he puts it somewhere else again, and he peels it off, a different color. Part of it sticks to it. He kept doing it and kept doing it until he got to a point that tape could no longer stick to anything. That's what happens when you sleep around. That's literally what happens. So every time you share the bed with the, the, the concept of marriage as God intended it, I always say this, God never intended for us to have exes. Now, I know these things happen, but I'm saying what the original plan of God was. The fewer the exes you, you have, the less the baggage you will carry into marriage. Can I say that again? <laughs> the more the exes, the more the baggage. So you find it difficult to stick to the person that you marry because the Bible says you live and you cleave, but you find it difficult because th there's been too much spread all over the place. Every time you share a bed with somebody, you are leaving part of yourself with that person. That's why you have soul ties with people. And people can understand how after even 10, 20 years, they meet an ex that they slept with 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and something just ignites. They call it a flame. Yeah, it's, it's because part of you was deposited there. And you are, you are depositing it all around. If you, can, if you can help yourself to the point where you have as few deposits as possible, then you have more to give to the person that you marry. And then you, you put yourself in a better position to do these things right. Glory to God. All right, I know we are not in church, but you have to pardon me. I'm a pastor, okay? <laughs> Number three, boundary. Of course, this one is very, very unpopular, but you have to let yourself know that you are not going to live with anybody you are not married to until they put a ring on it. Can I hear somebody say, put a ring on it? Put a ring on it. Put a ring on it. The brothers are not happy about that one, but they've got to put a ring on it. They've got to make a commitment. When you start living with somebody, it's like you are giving them the benefit of marrying you without actually having to marry you. You are giving them the benefits. I know you are not a cow, but permit the illustration of drinking the milk without paying for the cow. Okay? That's exactly what you are doing. And that, those are the boundaries that you want to set for yourself. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 tells us to abstain from every appearance of evil. Anything that looks like evil. It doesn't have to be, to be evil. 
But if it, if it doesn't look right, just stay away from it. That's what he says. So that, those are the boundaries that you set, and that is rule number one. Number two, rule number two, if love was a game, the second rule that we play by is called communication. In any game that you watch, no matter what sport it is, the level of communication that the teammates can achieve determines how well they will play together. If they are not talking, everybody is just running where they like and just doing what they like and nobody is telling each other where to be and when the ball is coming, they are not telling them to leave the ball, it will be chaos. It will be chaos. And once in a while, you find teams where they are playing and because of, of friction with communication, they start to fight on the field. How many people have seen that before? When that happens, in your mind, you, you tell yourself, these people have already lost. The minute they start to do that, you tell yourself right away that they, they are, that's, that's how it is with marriage. When you see couples who cannot communicate freely with each other, this is why I always say this. You've got to marry your friend or become friends with who you marry. Look, if you, if you find out that the person you're dating or you're in a courtship relationship with, you cannot express yourself freely with the person, that is a red flag. That is a big red flag. You have got to be able, I know we always like to put our best foot forward when we are starting out, but I'm telling you, you've got to get to the point where you are free to pollute the air. Okay, let me leave that. Let me leave that alone. Uh, otherwise, there's going to come a time, there's going to come a time where you have to be hiding everything about yourself. You've got to be, you've got to be free. You have to be able to say, say what is on your mind. It's better for you to receive the judgments before you get married than for you to get married and then start receiving judgment that you didn't receive. Uh -huh. So you want to put it all out there and let it be clean and open so that you are free. You are able to talk to this person about your deepest feelings, whatever the problem is, how, however you are, you are feeling at every point in time, this is important. Teams that don't communicate always look ridiculous on the field. Don't marry somebody you cannot communicate freely with before you get married. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. It tells us that two cannot work together unless they are agreed. There's got to be that clear cut agreement. The other side to this is before you get married to somebody, you've got to watch out for their language. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 again talks about this. It says, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to your partner. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Let your words be an encouragement. If you're dating somebody and they have already started abusing you verbally, they will eventually abuse you physically. I will say that again. If you are dating somebody right now and the person has already started calling you stupid girl, big head, look at you. Uh -huh. and started, I've started using all those kind of languages. It's just, it's just a matter of time because these things never diminish. They only graduate. They only go from one level to the other. And don't be in, in the, the place where you feel like, oh, I'm so, uh, if, if I don't marry him, who will I marry? Look, they, we have friends who are wishing right now that they were single rather than being in the kind of marriage that they are in just because of the level of abuse that they are facing. So this is why, this is my heart for you guys. This is why we are doing all this, all this work. Is I, I, don't want to, I don't want to have to be doing marriage counseling for things that you can fix before you get married because most of these things, you see them. They are red flags. You see them before you go into it. But because of time, because of desperation, all of those things. So that's the first thing. Don't, don't, don't hang around somebody who is communicating with you with insults, with verbal abuses. Let your conversation be gracious and let it be attractive. Let's move on to rule number three. Finally, rule number three is goals. I know we use this, this word freely these days. Uh, we say things like couple goals, relationship goals, you know, this, this is goals. But you have to think about it at a deeper level than that. It's not just goals, goals, goals. It's what is the goal behind this relationship that I am getting myself into? That is the first thing. Because when you are playing a game, there is a definition. There is a purpose behind the, the game. If, if, if people are playing soccer, there is, there is teams. There is, there is 11 players, 11 players. The goal is to get the ball into the other person's net as many times as possible without conceding on your own side. It's as simple as that. So for you, you have to know from the get-go, what is the goal of this relationship for me? These are the rules. What is the goal of this relationship? Now, some people have, believe it or not, all kinds of goals behind their relationship. There's all sorts of things. Some people, it's all about children. I I'm just looking, I'm not looking for a husband, I just want you, have you ever heard that before? 
You are pretending that you are not in 2024. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want you. I don't want any husband. I just want children. Does anybody know where I can collect? Okay, let me. I think I should stick with my message. Okay, without having all the stress of demand, I don't want demand. All I want is is children. From the get go, you have to understand that if you are if you are a guy that is looking for a wife, you must be able to detect whether you are getting married to somebody who wants your your deposit or wants you. <laughs> These things have to be clear clear from the beginning. So some people want Mrs. Taito. They are not interested in that whole concept of marriage as the institution. They just want to have that title of Mrs. I want to be on another level from my parents. I don't want to be a single anymore. I just want to be, you know, when, they, when they call me, they call me Mrs. So-and-so. You know, they say it, it has a nice ring to it. Have you ever heard that? It's, it's got a nice ring to it. Then they hyphenate the name and they say, Carlton Badejo. It has a nice ring to it. And say, ah, I want, I want that as my name. Then some, uh, let, me, let me shock you. You know there are people who are changing names before they actually get married? You have not met them. Oh, you guys have not met a lot of people. There are people now who are actually applying for change of name before their actual marriage has happened. Because that tells you what the motive is. That's the motivation. That is the drive. That's the goal. Their goal is, is that. Start. So, and once that goal is achieved, every other, per- every other thing in the marriage becomes meaningless to them. It just becomes a, a, a chore. It becomes boring. So after some time, that's where you now find out. They now start telling you things like irreconcilable differences mm-hmm. and all of these different things. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that the, the real intention is the same thing. If your goal for getting married was children, when you have enough children to your satisfaction, the marriage is over. Of, t- technically, as far as you are concerned, the marriage is over. The man is married to himself <laughs> from that point. So you, are, you have got to know. And the way you know these things is the, is the rule number two, which is that you communicate. You ask questions. There is, a, there is a book that I'm going to come out with in the future that is called, one, you know, I like 1001 a lot. So it's 1001 questions to sit down and ask before you get married. Look, down to the tiny bits. My wife and I asked each other questions like, who is going to be doing the laundry? Like basic stuff. Get it down to, it doesn't mean that those questions, the answers will remain the same till eternity. Those answers have changed now, right? But it just helps you to see how this person is thinking to understand where they are coming from, to understand what you are getting yourself into, so that you are not, you are not stuck in a, in a relationship that you look back and say, okay, I, I, I think single life is better than this. And the reason why many singles feel that way, where they, they, they look at marriage as you know, this thing that is, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to do this, is because imagine you are about to, you, to board a plane, you know, um, or, or let's say you have not, not even gone through the boarding of the plane, you are thinking about going on vacation to Hawaii or something. And you put on your TV, and, and, and they, they start showing you that 50% of all the planes that have taken off from the airport to go to Hawaii have crashed. They did not end in that destination. Uh, huh? As you are on that travel website, you will close your computer like this. <laughs> and say, oh boy, I'm not, I'm not going to Hawaii. <laughs> I will stay at We Are. Yeah. <laughs> no Hawaii. That's how marriage is for some people, because all they see are examples of people who have crashed. Yeah, that's all they see. Those are all the examples before them. And they say, ah, if this is how this thing is, I better just remain single. But I'm telling you, your, your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you do it God's way. It, God is, it has a 100% chance of success because God is the one who instituted this and is the only one that can tell us how to do it. So what, what we are seeing right now is that we are all trying to do it ap- apart from the one that, that instituted the thing called marriage. That's why there's a lot of struggle. All right, so let's tie it up. So you need to make that clear. Ask those questions. Okay, are you getting married because of parental pressure? Is it because of society? Do you view marriage as an achievement? You know, for some people, it's another achievement on the list. I have my BSc, I have my MSc, I have my marriage SC. It's another achievement. It's just to tick off. So those things, you have to know what you are doing. Look, I had a friend recently who was telling me about um, when they, when they, they got together. This was another long distance thing. You know, nowadays, I don't know how you guys meet anymore. That's why I try to make sure that this single seminar, no married person will be allowed in here. In Jesus' name. So that you can meet, <laughs> you can meet people that are actually single. Because this day is all about apps and swiping. No, but, so, so you do your mouth like this. <laughs> and post the, the, best, <laughs> the best version of the pictures. And the person you know, just meets that best version of you. So what you now find is that you have to keep up with that, that image all through. You have to, to keep. So the minute that image is no longer what the person sees, it becomes a problem. So the story I was going to tell you is about my friend who said that when they met online, this person was in another part of the country and, and she was in another part of the country and they were communicating. She said to me the second day that they started talking, after the person swiped on the app, 
Huh? And he said, you match. The second day, she asked him, do you want children? You are laughing, but the truth of the matter is that there are some, look, you, you, you will be shocked. There are many more. Than, and when we, when we start talking about intertribal relationships, you will see where, where this comes in. There are many more people in society today who don't want to have any children than those who actually want to. Yeah. So she said, this is important to me. Dude, uh, don't waste my time. Do you want children, yes or no? Uh, I first, he first did like this and did like this. Eventually, he said, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But, so she was clear from the beginning. And that's what you have to do. Sometimes it might come across as being upfront or being out there. But if it's important to you, it's important enough for you to bring it up. You don't have to wait until the third date. There's nothing like that. The person that swiped already knows that they like you. Am I talking to singles? Yes. They already know they like you, so there's no need to pretend. You get what I'm talking about? It's not like, like my own day when you are winking in the dark in the room. Everywhere, there's no light in the room. You are just winking in one corner, hoping that she sees you. Nobody does that again. The app has told you that this person matches with you. It means that there is an interest. So ask the questions that matter to you. You, you get what I'm saying? Like your faith, what do you believe in? Are we together on that? Okay, that's good. Pass. Do you want children? Don't, don't come and tell me that, you know, when we get a dog, we are okay. Uh -huh. so, so you make it clear, uh -huh, and you move on, all right? So, so apart from all of this, though, that are our own personal goals, there is a greater goal, which is where the, the God factor comes into the picture. Uh, and, and like I like to say, sex is a good reason to get married, but it cannot be your only reason for getting married. Otherwise, you'll be frustrated. Yeah, because there are many, many seasons in marriage that sex is not possible. Oh, so only Sako is nodding because he understands. He understands what I'm saying. There are many seasons in marriage where it's not, but where you have to exercise even more self-control than you did when you were single. Yeah. So that cannot be your only reason. Uh -huh. Even though it's a valid reason, there's got to be a greater purpose behind it. And that's where what the purpose and the plan of God for marriage itself, that's where it comes into play, is that why did God institute this? What was God's thinking? God is counting on us to be fathers, to be mothers, to raise another generation that we can pass on godly values to, that we can disciple and train in the ways that we have been trained. Not that we come to the West and just lose our minds, just lose everything, lose all our values, because all your friends now are, are from different parts of the world and all your professors are passing on garbage to you. You consume all of that, throw away all the values that you, you, you grew up with. So what, what you do is to understand that what marriage is about is that it's really about the legacy that you are leaving for another generation. Glory to God. So, God is counting on you to pass on those. I think I'll stop here for now, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to save some time for the, for the question part. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll vacate the stage because it's a little bit tensed. I've been telling you what not to do. Um, I'll let my friend Sako come and, and tell you what to do. <laughs> and hopefully make you laugh and relax a little bit. Let's put our hands together for him as he comes. Thank you.